Um, this is being recorded, so you can go back and look at some of the material if you need to. Um, I produced the Africanized honeybee book in the Americas uh, a number of years ago, and it talks about um, Africanized bees in a number of the countries, uh, including uh, its arrival and what's happening in the U.S. I'm going to do this in three parts this evening. Uh, the first part, I'm going to talk about defensive bees uh, because those that's an issue that we all might face uh, as beekeepers um, and then have a chance for some questions. Uh, uh, you can put questions in chat or if you, if you, uh, you know, we can go live at that point. The second section will be some information on Africanized bees and then uh, another chance for some questions. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about uh, where I am now in Bolivia and Africanized bees down here. If we don't get to your questions, et cetera, uh, you've got other ones. I put my email address here down at the bottom of this first one. Uh, I use the University of Delaware, uh, where I'm an emeritus professor. And uh, uh, feel free to uh, give me a, a holler on the email, and I'll see if I can try to answer your questions. All right, let's get started. Um, I, want, I hope that you will excuse any senior movements that I might have. Um, one of the stories that we just heard is two seniors in the home are playing cards, and one says to the other, I'm so embarrassed. I've known you for years, but right now I, I can't remember your name. To which the other replies, oh, dear, when do you need to know this? So I hope we'll uh, not have too many uh, senior moments with our session this evening. The gutter, one looks up and says to the other, look, here comes man's best friend. To which the second drunk says, yay, it is coming with a dog. All right, let's get on to some, um, some activities here. Let's see what we have. I'm going to talk initially, as I said, about defensive bees. Um, I use that term rather than aggressive. Um, their biology is defense. Uh, they seem to be coming after us, but it's, it's, it's in response to some sort of a stimulus. Um, we know colonies have guards. Uh, those guards are really looking at other bees. What happens with stinging bees most often with us is that those are what we call soldier bees, soldiers of the hive. And those are, are bees that will respond to the disturbance. Our opening the hive, for example, um, can be, sometimes is a, a disturbance. Uh, bee defense is really um, not one thing. It's really a four-stage response. Um, initially, there's something that's alerting them, um, opening up the hive, for example, or, or uh, scraping a piece of equipment against another piece. Uh, then an activating where the, uh, the uh, individuals that might be the defenders, those soldiers, are then getting prepared. Then attracting, so they're going towards something, going towards that disturbance or the opening of the hive, the opening, the light, for example. And then what we're so familiar with is that last stage. And, and really at that point, bees have a couple of different options. One is to sting, uh, but there is also a fleeing behavior that is to leave, um, to get away from that particular dis uh, uh, disturbance. Um, the Africanized honeybees that we're going to talk about are, they, ha they have the sting de defense. They're, they're a very, very defensive grouping of bees. Um, I'll talk about what Africanized bees are um, in this second section. So somehow a colony gets alerted. As I say, the top, the top is open. Uh, we bump it. An animal bumps it. A skunk comes at night to scratch on the outside. Um, that then that will then be the, leading to the second stage, then that activating. Um, initially, bees will attempt to intimidate us. Um, that is, they fly at us. And the most, most prominent features for them to be able to see with their compound eyes is uh, differences. So where a sleeve meets uh, a bare skin, where the gloves end at the wrist, for example, uh, where um, our face is, a uh, lot of features there that for, with their eyes they're capable of seeing. And, and their, their first um, response then is on that um, attracting to that disturbance is to try to intimidate it. So you may initially experience bees just flying out of a colony and bouncing off your veil. That's, that's their that's their intimidating uh, uh, type of a response. 
um, they are attracted to several different things. So that movement, if you move your hand fast across an open county, for example, you may have bees just fly right out at your, at your, at your moving arm, your moving hand. Um, smells, for example, um, things that look different. Um, so they have various things in which they're, they're going to be attracted to in terms of trying to do their the defense of their county. Um, and then, of course, the, the last stage followed by the sting. And the sting is actually a, um, a mechanism by which uh, individual bees help attract help, help get more help from within their county. Because when the bee stings, um, what it is actually doing is uh, leaving behind a odor, a specific odor, what we call an alarm odor. And so um, they are, are actually trying to, to help defend by giving up their life, but uh, to be able to have an appropriate response um, to that last uh, uh, stage in terms of the, of the bees the defending a colony, defending themselves. Um, defensive bees, um, our Africanized bees, um, they're not doing anything that other bees don't do. Uh, Africanized bees just do it more quickly, and then they persist in their, their continuing that behavior. Uh, many colonies will be maybe defensive. For example, you rushing your hand, you're moving your hand quickly across the top, uh, but then they settle right back in. Uh, but some groups of bees are just more defensive. And so that, that re response is more quickly and a longer response, a more persistent response. So that's a look at terms of, of some of the things that defensive bees. Um, here's a selfie. Um, that, those are all bees. That is the bee veil um, in front of my face. And you can see um, they are attracted because um, they are coming to a scent. They're carbon, the higher carbon dioxide as I'm breathing out. Um, they're also attracted to the fact that they can see, see all those different features. Uh, and that's what that attraction is uh, uh, for where they're coming. So they don't intuitively know that we don't like bees flying in our face, around our face. Um, it's just that with their defense capabilities, that's where they will concentrate. And I said initially, maybe just bouncing off that veil. Now, once we have colonies open, uh, uh, typically we will get a, a rather a pronounced a, a response um, to the point that as we're working Africanized bees, and often it is advised that you, you not do this alone, you, you work with someone else. Uh, but after we've opened a couple, three colonies, we actually end up having to shout to, uh, to someone else because there just are so many bees that have been released that are in the air that have left their colony. Um, so much noise from just bees flying that um, you speak in a normal voice and the person next to you or across from you won't be able to hear. You actually have to shout uh, from, from that type of response. And once in, a cow, in an apiary, you hit a colony that's more defensive than others. And there is variation in the colonies just as there is variation in honey production variation in wintering ability, variation in mite numbers. Um, there is in defensive behaviors. And once you hit that defensive colony in the apiary, then you are uh, walking uh, alarm because you have so many stings that get embedded in your equipment that then you open up another colony and that's just adding to more bees. So um, we often will try to keep the more defensive colonies to the end of an inspection and in some cases, we simply can't get what we want done in the apiary. Just too many bees, just making it too uncomfortable. You sort of at this point are sort of like a robot. You don't want to have a, a bee sting through your equipment. And so you're sort of doing a robot type movements uh, because of their defense. Uh, let's see. Whoops, I better go back one here. Uh, why, why are bees defensive? Um, there is no one single factor that leads to this behavior. Uh, why are Africa AHB is what I'm saying, Africanized honeybees. Why are they defensive? Um, certainly changing weather conditions. And of course, we know that if you're in colonies uh, in New Jersey and under less than ideal conditions, you might have the chance of more stings. Bees that are hungry, that are not getting very good resources. 
that biology of alerting, uh, biology of the response to the stimulus of a sting, in other words, responding because there is a sting sticking in a person's skin or your equipment. Uh, queenless conditions will lead to uh, more defensive behaviors. Uh, they are usually one of the, the responses um, are to different smells and certainly to movements, jarring. You've heard about vibration to the colony. Um, we had a very defensive bee yard and um, it was on the road to where the garbage trucks would be going towards the, the uh, garbage the, the depository. We moved those colonies and um, those that, that whole apiary after movement was much easier to manage than it was while they were being disturbed rather frequently with, uh, with garbage trucks going by on the road. Disturbances, predators at night. I mentioned skunks, for example. Uh, we are uh, we are a, a predator uh, for uh, colonies, uh, at least that's their perception, and so beekeepers. Changing locations, and of course, genetics has a has a certainly has a factor in it. Um, the genetics of African high honey bees are have been selected for that behavior, and that's why they are among all of the bees in the world one of those that are more defensive but we have others that uh, you know temporarily may be defensive, et cetera. So genetics uh, very much a factor. And so one of our efforts always is to uh, very defensive colonies. If we can manage it uh, rather than euthanizing it, we, we try to change the queen. In the chat, by the way, I did put a reference to uh, Kevin England's uh, uh, video that he made on euthanizing a colony. And when we talk about Africanized honeybees, um, that is a kind of a classic that he's showing um, in terms of how to manage, how not how he has attempted to manage a colony and then decided to euthanize it uh, using soapy water. So if you ever get to that situation, you might refer to uh, Kevin. Kevin's in the uh, your neighboring club there in New Jersey, North Jersey. So what do we do uh, with uh, honeybees uh, handling defensive bees? Um, I have a, a book chapter uh, as well as a, a gleanings or a bee culture magazine article on defensive bees that, you, that are referred to in this uh, slides. Um, here's the honeybee medicine, very kind of an expensive book, but uh, I have a good chapter because uh, uh, this is a, a teaching book for uh, veterinarians to learn how to uh, be, do uh, bee inspections and looking, of course, for uh, for the diseases of European and American fowl brood, which require a veterinarian prescription to be able to get um, antibiotics if you want to use those. So what are uh, some 10 things? Don't, don't unless absolutely needed, don't uh, handle those colonies. Avoid that movement vibration, um, uh, putting bees on one stand uh, transmits vibrations to all the bees on that same stand. So individual hive stands, you have to be prepared. Um, uh, go into an apiary prepared with your own personal protective equipment. Um, you can take uh, equipment off, but uh, once you get that reaction and all those bees in the air, um, there's no way you can then start adding pieces of equipment. Manipulate colonies only when necessary during appropriate weather conditions. As I indicated there, a colony that is docile today might not be tomorrow under different weather conditions. So watch your weather. Um, and if it's if they seem to be more defensive, then that just might be a good idea to close it up and try to come back a different day. Um, don't manipulate them in the dark, but towards the end of the day. And the nice thing with that, uh, with a more defensive bees in an apiary, is they then have a chance to settle down over the evening time and so then a visit the next day might be a possibility to, to be able to do. Um, be fast, but gentle. Avoid excessive time consuming manipulations. Um, with our Afghanized bees, we just make it as simple as we can. Um, we are not extensive manipulators of our colonies. I'll get to that point a little bit later. Use of your weaker, your smaller colonies, uh, particularly if you are inexperienced, uh, versus trying to uh, go into full-size colonies. Those bees that uh, some of you are going to start this spring from nukes or packaged bees 
will grow into monsters. And, um, and what you can do is split a one or more of those monsters and, and still get your time in bees that you want. Um, it's important for new beekeepers to get as much opportunity as they can to manipulate colonies under different conditions, but pick on those small colonies, pick on the splits. We keep with Africanized bees, uh, the colony small. Um, uh, Landy's gonna talk to you about uh, keeping uh, colonies in New Jersey, North Jersey, in single hive bodies, which is a smaller configuration than with two hive bodies. Um, we do that all the time with Africanized honeybees. We have to. Um, we do an awful lot of splitting. We do an awful lot of requeening of units by at the time that we split. And hopefully then um, with the requeening, we have some selected stock, someone that's breeding a little bit better bee, um, has brought in some other stock sometimes or just from our own experience. And often we're not trying to put queens in the colonies. Um, our Africanized bees are just terrible for accepting queens. They just don't want to do that. Um, so we requeen an awful lot with queen cells. Um, so some of the points that Landy is going to make uh, next month with, uh, I think it's next month, I think Landy said, with uh, how to keep bees in smaller configurations, managing in one box, is what we have to do all the time with Africanized bees. Africanized bees get more defensive when they have resources, so we harvest. We harvest about weekly. We take outer frames out of the box, out of the single box, and harvest them. And, um, and then uh, get the frames back in the next day or a day after that if we don't have extra frames. Uh, they just get more defensive. And so rather than piling up boxes, uh, supers, for example, a more frequent uh, harvest. Um, one of the advantage with that in a small configuration of just a single high body is that uh, you'll have different honeys. So if you have the, your market, um, uh, uh, that is, you are marketing honey or attempting to do so, you'll have different honeys to sell. So you can make two sales with two different honeys and then two jars of the same thing. Uh, and then we really do have to uh, consider killing colonies that are very defensive or euthanizing them. We can do that with soapy water. Um, and as I indicated, I've made a reference to uh, Kevin England's uh, uh, video on that aspect. You really do have to get rid of some. Now, um, as I try to, I'm going to seg into uh, Africanized honeybees. Um, I have some likes and dislikes here that I'd like to, to, to cover initially. So L equals means I like that most of the feral um, wild honeybees in your area, there in North Jersey, uh, they're not Africanized. Uh, but there is a dislike um, in that you might get summer introductions and that might come with requeening, that might come with introduction of uh, packages from the South, for example. Um, it might come from a transport by a commercial beekeeper um, into somewhere in Jersey and then more Queens reared wherever. It may come from a number of different sources. I like and dislike that Africanized honeybees swarm much more frequently than other honeybees. Uh, they multiply as fast as possible, which is simply their, their survival instinct. And that makes it uh, very easy to uh, have swarms to be able to capture, uh, to, read, uh, read, to habit, inhabit more of your boxes. Africanized honeybees are gleaners. They don't wait to be stimulated by hive conditions or by scout bees that come back and tell their sisters through dance language where and what the source is that they have found. So they're gleaners. They'll just uh, leave home. Um, they they uh, outcompete European bees in the same area because they get up early and they um, can uh, drain a whole resource before European bees are even ready to get started. Um, I dislike it that they're not honey stores. Um, if you're in the business to produce honey, um, this is not the bee to do it. Um, if, uh, particularly when um, conditions are, are on the poor side. Um, and I also dislike that when those conditions get very poor, they simply leave, they leave home. That's their behavior in Africa uh, where they can go a few hundred miles and find different conditions. Um, that doesn't work in, in uh, most of the U.S., except for the southern states, 
Um, but we do see absconding in our bees as well. I like and dislike that they have um, um, uh, their own biology. They're a fascinating bee to study. They have a, a number of mechanisms to help maintain their own identity, their own gen genetic identity. Uh, and um, they are, are masters at being able to invade uh, an area. And as a pioneer population, they then can simply swamp the area with what they are and change over what's in that area to, to become what they are. Uh, we have to requeen um, and small hive management. Uh, small hive management is not as easy as with two boxes, but it, uh, it does have some uh, number of different benefits. Um, our problem and that is that sometimes our queen stock gets Africanized. Uh, and so our stock, as in the U.S., is variable to try to get to a, a more gentler bee. Um, and I really like that they fight the mite. Um, we do not ne normally have to do very much uh, mite control here in Bolivia, simply because they are much better in controlling the mites themselves rather than us having to do it. Well, that's a bit of information on defensive bees. Uh, I don't know if there have been some questions so far put in chat. I'll quickly open up chat and see what we've got. Um, let's see. How do you get good honey crops if you must consistently split and knock down the numbers? You just do it with numbers. You don't get a good ha harvest from any one colony, although it's variable. Um, you just get, a, you try to harvest a number of colonies. Someone else thinking, uh, because I don't, I don't run bees in singles. I do triple mediums. Uh, yeah, that's our, that's our tradition. Um, double standards or triple mediums is our standard. It is much more difficult to do a single high body. So um, pay attention to, to Landy. There are some people that can do that and do that well. We have had uh, AFB come into the Elizabeth Port on ships. Yes, um, swarms, um, abscons and swarms are common. Um, and they come into all of our major ports, including the, the, uh, the uh, Port of New York, Elizabeth, uh, that whole complex of ports. Yes, they do. They do come in our ports. Uh, question, I'm going to develop a small farm on an island about 10 miles off the coast of Belize. I've seen honeybees of some type in the island. Um, you think uh, trying to capture a swarm is a good approach to get started? Yes, capturing swarms all the time is a good approach to get started. They're likely to be Africanized honeybees in that area, 10 miles off, off the coast of Belize. Um, and and um, you'll, just, you'll just find some that are more amenable. And uh, from that, you'll make your splits from that. Uh, just don't handle those that are just the most defensive and you'll be okay. Uh, by the way, uh, it depends on the size of the island. Um, uh, 10 miles is a little bit beyond their foraging, so you may not be able to have a, a large uh, number. Uh, there are a huge number of islands off the coast of Belize, and, and many of them are just a little too small for keeping bees. How many queens from the south are Africanized? Do, do most have AHB genetics? Um, it's variable. It uh, depends on the producer of those queens. Uh, Georgia has made a very concerted effort to eliminate Africanized honeybees in Georgia. So the stuff coming out of Georgia is generally very clean. It's the stuff coming out of um, um, Louisiana, uh, coming um, out of Florida that is more likely to be Africanized. The percentage is pretty small. Um, uh, here on the West Coast, we're getting a lot of stuff out of California, and our percentages are a little bit higher. But it's 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 certainly under 10 percent uh, uh, in terms of having any material of Africanized honeybees uh, being mixed in. And generally, if there is more Africanized honeybee genetics uh, mixed in, they will not uh, winter as well. Uh, Landy, I'm not doing any talks on keeping bees and singles. Oh, Landy, I'm sorry. I, I read that you were going to do that. I'm not, I really stand corrected. Sorry, Landy. I didn't, I didn't mean it is a, it is a real, uh, the real artist of beekeeping can do this in singles. Many of you are familiar with a fellow up in Alberta, uh, I'm sorry, Manitoba, um, Ian Stepler. He talks a lot about his management in singles. 
Some of you may, I think probably you've had Steve Rapaski from the Pittsburgh area talk at one time or another. Or many of you heard him talk, perhaps. Steve is a single, uh, does a lot of management in singles. So if you ever get a chance to catch either of those two and talking about singles, um, it's, uh, and if you're thinking about it, uh, listen well to someone that's done it ahead of time before you adapt it yourself. If anyone has overly defensive bees, they should requeen ASAP, especially in our suburban area. Yeah. Um, uh, what I say is that you can have at one time defensive bees. It can carry over to the next time. But if you go two, three, four times to your colony and they are really responding, they are defensive, then certainly um, try to requeen. The issue is, it is very difficult to requeen the defensive bees because to requeen, you've got to dequeen first. That means you've got to find a queen. So it's a tough management. Um, and if you have anything that looks like uh, what Kevin is showing on that video, uh, don't even attempt to try to requeen. Kevin does mention trying to requeen, um, get rid of them. Uh, do any AHA bees in New Jersey survive the winter? Um, the, initially, as they as we get uh, Africanized honeybees into more northerly areas, uh, no, most of them or all of them, we think, do not survive the winter. They are surviving in the southern states, but not in our winters. However, um, I am at 8,200 feet, which is more in a big valley of the Andes Mountains in Bolivia. And here they do survive our year. Uh, so it's much more, this is a, this is a fruit growing area, dairy cattle, uh, uh, mixed vegetables. Um, so it's very much like uh, North Jersey, uh, climates, temperament, uh, or, or temperatures, um, New York State, uh, Southern Vermont, where I'm from initially. Um, and so 8,200 feet is, is much like a temperate climate, not tropical, and they do survive here. They didn't initially, but they, they do adapt to it. Uh, I'll see if I can book one of them. Okay. Not sure what that meant. Landy? Oh, oh, Landy says she should go see if she can book someone that is going to do the singles management. Um, it, if you really want to challenge yourself, try it. It uh, um, you, you you do you do a lot of you may temporarily go into two boxes, but uh, but not as much. And you do it in con in conjunction with your swarm control. So it's it's kind of accomplishing two things at one time. All righty. So let me go on and talk a little bit. Uh, great questions. Appreciate your questions. Let me go on and talk a little bit in my next section here, just about Africanized bees. So we're on the same page. Africanized bees are a population out of East Africa. Africa has a number of different populations of bees, what we call races of bees at one time, or subspecies. So it has the name of a subspecies, Apis mellifera scutellata. And we've kept, uh, humans have kept bees in Africa for a very long time. Our European bees are descendants of African bees. We're thinking that, that bees themselves, honeybees, uh, developed, evolved in Asia and then moved uh, into, uh, um, through India into Africa, through the Middle East into Africa, and then northward into Europe. And so our bees, what we call Italian bees, what we call Carniolan bees, are different groupings of Africanized bees that have left Africa, have moved northward as conditions were, were favorable in two different directions. One through the Iberian Peninsula through Spain, that's our Italian bees and our German bees, and the other through the, uh, the Middle East, uh, what we call our Caucasian and our Carniolan bees. Um, and that depiction upper left is of a Maasai warrior who's using smoke and fire to harvest his bees in a log cylinder hive there above his head. Uh, we use smoke uh, in terms of our, our working with bees. Um, and um, the, some of us keep bees in what we call um, top bar hive or the Kenyan top bar hive, which is a modification of that rolled bark log that's above the, uh, the uh, individual's head there. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, we don't, they're not movable frame hives, they're fixed comb hives. So you end up driving the population away, 
um, to be able to harvest. And the harvest is of everything because the value is not just honey. The harvest is of of um, the brood, um, the the pollen itself, uh, the bee bread, stored pollen, bee bread, and um, their uh, cash crop uh, with limited distribution of African honeys into the rest of the world, their cash crop is beeswax. And that's what our cosmetic industry uses that uh, naturally harvest beeswax from, uh, from beekeepers throughout, uh, throughout the uh, African countries. They were then moved to Brazil, uh, where there was a mixture of bees uh, kept in some Langstroth hives or in very rustic hives, just box hives. You see there on the right, a box hive. Uh, and then um, from that, as resulting, we have a population that we call uh, hybrid or Africanized bees. It was a mixture of the bees brought from Africa into Brazil with the bees that were currently in Brazil most of them coming from Spain, from, uh, from Europe. They were European bees kept by beekeepers. And so the bee is a bit of a mixture of the two, and hence we use the name in the US or in the Americas, Africanized, indicating that that is hybrid. Now, what happens, however, in, in particularly tropical and subtropical areas is the Africanized bees outcompete European bees and so in those areas, most of the populations are more African genetic material than they are European. And as you go north uh, or in South America, as you go to south, um, then the populations become more European bees until, uh, for example, in the north, uh, we keep mostly um, European bees. In Argentina uh, and Chile, they keep mostly uh, European bees as well. But it has changed the bees and beekeeping in the Americas. No question about that at all. Now, why? Uh, how did the stock get to Brazil? The Brazilian beekeepers uh, felt that they uh, uh, were uh, not using the most favorable bee for the climate of Brazil. So they um, asked that a geneticist, a very famous uh, uh, geneticist uh, from one of the universities, go and look at bees in both Asia and Africa. And uh, Dr. Warwick Kerr did, and he, he selected some bees. He sent them back. Uh, the bees went through Portugal. They were killed. Um, this was queens that he had in cages. And so to salvage some bees at his final, um, uh, on his own personal trip back to Brazil, he took bees from two queen breeders in uh, South Africa and a, uh, some bees that he still had left over from a couple of countries north of the country of South Africa. And he brought those back. Um, if this sounds like crazy, um, it's something that we did. Uh, Langstroth, after he uh, published his book on uh, Hive and the Honeybee and developed a, the first really practical removal frame hive, he then championed the use of bees from Italy. And he was one of the very first breeders of bees from Italy. And why? Because the bees that we had in the U.S. up into the 18, uh, middle 1800s uh, were mostly northern European bees, and um, they were quite susceptible to European fowl brood and um, are kind of a nasty bee. If you've ever looked at bees in the United Kingdom, in Wales, in, in Ireland or Scotland, you know that their bees are not a gentle bee like we use, like we have with our Italian bees. They're, they're a much more defensive bee. And so um, this was an attempt to, to get a bee that was more favorable for his hive. And other beekeepers agreed. There were great reports coming out of northern Italy about uh, how gentle the bees were and how productive the bees were um, here in the middle 1800s. And so we did the very same thing. And of course, we then brought in some other bees as well. So it's not um, unheard of for, uh, for a, a possible solution to a bee that's not doing well um, in Brazil um, uh, in the uh, middle of the 1900s or in the U.S. in the middle of the 1800s to go somewhere else and bring some other stock in. And still people are saying, we need to bring more stock into the U.S. We need to do this and that. Well, there are some downsides. And uh, we were entirely, very successful with bringing in Italian bees in the middle 1800s. 
Um, it was not so successful bringing in African bees in the middle 1900s. So what happened was the bees maintained their own identity. So from the, that introduction in 50s, middle 50s, 50, 1950, 57, the bees spread, quickly developed a reputation. They spread to near, neighboring Paraguay within five years to uh, uh, Bolivia, where I am, within 10 years, southward into Uruguay and, and, and in Argentina, and then continued their spread. And we had various predictions they wouldn't get through across the Amazon. They moved very rapidly. Uh, we had set up a huge development of beekeepers in Venezuela um, saying, well, that's going to be a biological barrier. And what it did is it ended up a lot of people were killed in the first three years when it arrived in Venezuela because uh, of there were bees in backyards, et cetera. We said, well, nothing crosses the isthmus, but it, it did. It crosses the isthmus in, um, in uh, 82. Uh, well, then it would not get through South Central, through Central America with all of the uh, the leftist governments, but that didn't, they're not political, didn't make a difference. Would not get through uh, Mexico because we built a barrier there at the at the uh, the uh, narrowing of uh, of uh, uh, Mexico from uh, from Veracruz across to Hawaka. Uh, it did. Uh, we tried a three year barrier program. It reached Texas in 1990, reached Arizona a little bit later, California. Uh, didn't spread east for a variety of reasons, but then it, by ships it went into uh, to Florida. Um, and then we've then seen all these X's here up in, the, uh, up in Oregon, up in Maine, up in uh, Jersey, uh, Michigan, Illinois, um, across all those. We've had introductions, Virginia, one of those X's is a Virginia. It has some other names besides Africanized, which you may or may not be familiar with. Um, someone will call it a Brazilian bee. That's not fair. Um, it's, it has it's two foreign bees. Um, in in um, Brazil, they call it the foreign bee, but the press, uh, particularly uh, the American press, call it the, the assassin bee. Uh, some would like to say it's a neotropical bee. Um, so it's had various names. The name that has stuck is this Africanized bee. Uh, and in Africa, the bee, the same bee, the African bee, uh, depends then where you are is what you're going to name it. And of course, Time Magazine um, introduced our term killer bees based on some reports from newspapers out of Brazil. Uh, there was a famous bus accident a bus ran off the road with some kids and a couple of kids was, were, were killed, a number were injured and the driver was killed and it was because uh, bees entered the bus. Um, and so um, it got its name of Killer Bee by, by basically Time Magazine um, reading the, some of these stories from out of Brazil. There is no doubt that it has changed beekeeping and beekeepers. So here in, uh, in Arizona, um, a beekeeper with Africanized bees in the southern parts of many of our, uh, our, our first round of state, the first layer of states um, can only keep Africanized honeybees um, without a ex very extensive amount of requeening. And it is, is, is now in also the neighboring states to the north of all of our southern states with one exception, that is Georgia. Georgia has a very proactive program. They do not, uh, they believe that they, they state that they are free of Africanized bees. The spread was initially uh, um, examined. So there was a huge program initially in Texas where they put out lots of traps. Um, they did uh, a genetic, well, initially we did uh, by looking at some, some measurements of the wings. Um, I went across the South uh, while I was at the uh, University of, of Maryland doing training for uh, people to identify these bees using computer programs. Uh, so the color, the various colors show the year that it arrived. So you can see up to when the uh, USDA was keeping maps, and this is only up to eight, um, 19, 1914, 2014, let's get on the right century here, 2014. Uh, where they were keeping the states uh, the numbers. You can see that all of the states on the border and then the neighboring states, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Tennessee, uh, well, Tennessee up here, but not shown here. 
uh, Nevada, for example, um, Co uh, Colorado, Nevada, um, all of those have reports of Africanized honeybees. So that map is no longer being kept. What I did when uh, before I left uh, Delaware, University of Delaware in, the, in, uh, in uh, 2009 and moved to Oregon to be near my grandkids, uh, I worked with uh, Wayne Esaias, who, who uh, had access to some of the supercomputers um, there at Fort Meade, uh, the National uh, Defense uh, National Defense Agency, um, and we looked in terms of mapping using some environmental factors where the bees were currently in the United States. So we we looked at, at what some of the, the those frost-free days and the lowest winter temperature, et cetera, in Texas and in, in southern New Mexico and southern Arizona, California. Um, and we looked at the factors of where it was and then did um, a series of calculations as to where would it uh, possibly be able to spread in the United States. So the dark blue indicates uh, the Dakotas and Minnesota that, that very highly unlikely that we would have established populations of Africanized honeybees. That's not to say that they couldn't be moved from Texas up to Minnesota by a beekeeper, but established populations, in other words, living in a wild. And so the lighter the color is where they, we, um, from this um, uh, modeling, uh, were able to indicate that we thought that there was a, a suitability that they could uh, occur. So the high suitability, the lighter the color, all the way to the blue to very low suitability. And you can see the basic uh, configurations is up the West Coast, all the way up into where I am in Oregon and, and Washington State, and the East Coast along at least into the Carolinas. Um, more recently, um, some fellows at the uh, uh, using a supercomputer at the University of Co uh, Colorado, uh, Colorado State University, I'm sorry, um, have done a different modeling in terms of where they have occurred. And they built into their model, um, so in the fine print, they built into this logistic model uh, current spread where they were. And so this was this was uh, about uh, 12 years after we did our first model. The frost days, how many days of frost in, in a normal area, percent tree cover, mean temperature of the driest month, mean temperature of the wettest month, and uh, put all so the put all and then uh, the the. Uh, uh, other precipitation factors and temperature factors and put this into their, their computer model. And so this is their, what they say could be a possible habitat, a possible range. Um, you see it's extending a bit uh, from what we did earlier, more into uh, along the West Coast, into the interior states of uh, Nevada and Colorado, where they already are, and into Idaho. Uh, a bit again into the Midwest, up along the Mississippi, for example, but more extensive uh, distribution along the East Coast. Uh, and that, if, if, if there, you can see the last couple, the lowest couple counties, Cape Bay and uh, Sussex County in New Jersey, are with this bit of a dar darker color. So that it means it could be possible uh, feral populations, you know, established populations of Africanized bees in those particular areas. So uh, these are these are models. This is you know not predictive. When we initially, when it arrived in Texas in 1990, we thought that it would move along the Gulf Coast and inhabit Florida. And Florida is a very very favorable habitat for it, as you can see on both models. That didn't happen, and you notice in in the area in Alabama, coastal and coastal Mississippi, um, the, it is not the conditions. Um, uh, it is not just cold conditions in winter. It is also a factor of precipitation issues and cover uh, vegetation cover, and that's what has been built into this uh, second model that was developed at Colorado State. So take uh, this with a grain of salt. These are models of uh, predicted spread. Um, they're not going to be in Sussex County tomorrow, but it does indicate that uh, with their eventual movement up the East Coast, that they could perhaps establish populations in at least those counties uh, in Southern Jersey. 
Now, someone has indicated earlier they're coming into the port of Elizabeth. Indeed, they have. In the town of Ramsey, here's a story from 2017. The headline was Extraordinary Swarm of Aggressive Bees Attacked New Jersey Beekeepers. Two amateur beekeepers were attacked by their own bees in a res residential New Jersey neighborhood on Sunday. Um, this was in July 2017 prompting a local Office of Emergency Management to issue a warning for nearby, nearby residents to remain inside while the aggressive swarm had been contained. Such behavior, according to bee experts, is highly unusual and most unprecedented for the region. According to the statement issued by the Ramsey, New Jersey Office of Emergency Management, the hive was accidentally disturbed on Saturday afternoon. They just opened the colony, leading the bees to disperse throughout the northern New Jersey town. The amateur beekeeper who kept the hive in his private residence was found unconscious in his driveway. His wife was also hospitalized for stings. So this is backyard, uh, New Jersey. So have they been there? Yes. Are they coming there in the port? Yes. Um, is there a possibility that they can be in New Jersey permanently? Yes. Uh, but these are all singular accidents. Now this um, the bees uh, on this particular uh, instance were looked at and they were not found to be Africanized. They were found to just be a defensive colony. The beekeeper made a mistake and, um, um, and, and the bees did what bees do. Okay. Now, I, I've got to indicate that um, um, many people say, well, you know, I can tell that I've got Africanized bees because I've got very, very aggressive, i.e. defensive bees, or I can look at one and see what it is. Well, no, you can't. You can't tell because our ordinary colonies, ordinary, nice, gentle Italian bees, Carniolan bees, Russian bees, whatever bee you might have or might get into your colonies can all of a sudden become very defensive as witnessed by that one um, accident that one occurrence in, in Elizabeth and, and in many of other others as well in other places. So no, um, it takes an expert to look at them to be able to tell. Initially, we took measurements of their wings, of the angles, the lengths of the veins and bee wings. Um, now we're actually using genetic markers. So we do a, do a test uh, uh, and look at uh, for some specific markers that that the Africanized population has, but that the European population doesn't have. And defensive is not. Okay, so here's some homework uh, for you to, if you have more interest in following up on Africanized bees. MAREC includes New Jersey, that's the Middle Atlantic Apiculture Research and Extension Consortium, something that I helped establish. New Jersey is a member of this. We have a 2020 um, uh, leaflet, What is Africanized Honeybees? You can look that up. Uh, uh, North Carolina has a, has a nice uh, uh, article, a nice extension bulletin done by Dave Tarpey and Jennifer Keller. Africanized honeybees, when are they, where are they now and when will they arrive in North Carolina? Um, they've just recently looked at it and revised it. Wikipedia uh, has a good amount on Africanized bees. It's, it's one of the very good coverages of it. Pest World, um, they're listed uh, uh, um, under um, Africanized bees. And finally, Columbia University uh, in the city has a nice uh, uh, article in terms of, of Africanized bees. You'll see a lot of other junk, but here are some that I might recommend in terms of, uh, of looking at it. Uh, and, and looking a little bit further at it. Let me finally, uh, uh, one of our, one of the issues that we have and when we did the map of where they eventually would be distributed is um, when we, if you look, if you recall that map, it's where the queen breeders are. And um, queen breeders are in, um, in largely in Georgia on the East Coast. Uh, there are some others as well, all the way up into the Carolinas. But in the West Coast, they are largely in, um, in uh, uh, California, in, and some of them are also in, uh, in, into Southern Oregon. And uh, this is a larger queen breeding area. The, the, these are counties of California, and the counties that are red have established populations. So this is San Francisco up here. This is L.A. down here. 
San Diego, of course, on the Mexican border, L.A., um, San Francisco, uh, Sacramento, the state capital here. Um, you can see all those are an area where there are established populations. The queen breeding area starts here in the counties where almonds are and then extends northwards and still the, into the mountain start up here in Shasta County. Uh, and you can see they're well within this area. Uh, uh, most of the, of course, all the Texas queen breeders and the Louisiana breeders are all within areas and most of those in Florida as well. Um, so the Georgia population remains um, pretty much free. Um, this was a bit of a surprise. Um, so I have the reference here uh, to Lynn 2018 uh, uh, in terms of uh, it had been several years. Uh, California is not tracking where they are. And so they looked and they found that they're continuing their spread uh, northward. And one final point. Um, this is a bit complex, but there seems to be a zone in uh, northern uh, Argentina and across the uh, uh, Uruguay, which is the country here, uh, where north of the line it's Africanized honeybees and south of the line it's not. So here in Argentina, it is showing then north of the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, south, going towards the, the south pole, uh, the blue indicates uh, all the bees they find are, are um, European race. And going then northward, um, you come to where most of the bees are Africanized, the red. So this is on this transect from here, from northern Argentina down to south of Buenos Aires. Um, mo mo all those in the north are mostly Africanized. Those in the south are mostly European bees. So where most of the beekeeping is in, in Argentina, it's European bees. They do not have Africanized bees. And the bees have across the, the Andes, except in Peru, brought by people. And so Chile also has, has uh, virtually just European bees. Well, the California study is also looking at this transect. So here from the border of Mexico, San Diego, you can see all the dots are red as you go north towards San Francisco, most more of the dots become blue. So in California, uh, up in the Sacramento area, most everything is, is European. And you can see then as you go further south towards the Mexican border, more of this red. So this is, this is looking at genetic markers. Um, the problem in part is that this is a, a huge number of population, over 3,000 bees collected. In California, to do this study, they collected um, only 500 bees. But it is the, the study is what it is, indicating that, that there, does, there is a transition as you go further north in the U.S., further south in the southern hemisphere, um, there's less chance of, of there being Africanized uh, material mixed in with your bees. All righty, pause at this point. Um, let's see if I can go back. Uh, um, uh, can we skip up a little bit, uh, maybe? The first one I'm seeing from Landy, even better reasons to raise our own queens. Uh, totally, absolutely. Um, there are a lot of good reasons to raise queens, but uh, the fact that we can get them into New Jersey uh, uh, if they're coming from the south, it's a much better idea to raise our own than north. It looks like they're outside of the zone. Um, Justin indicates outside of the zone. Uh, Justin, I'm not sure what uh, we were we were talking about uh, Oliveras. Um, yeah. If you look further up, Dewey, I believe um, uh, John had a question. Um, how does Georgia keep uh, AHB out? seems to be a, a constant battle given how quickly they spread north who does the work is there a cost yes um and um it's a continual inspection service uh and eliminating colonies there is a cost yes uh it, but it's mostly individual beekeepers you know i can't i can't scroll this up uh, justin and mine I haven't been able to. So well, that's not. Okay. Uh, yeah, if there's anything else, I'll. Uh, okay. 
I know we had two people, uh, Adriana and Sarah, had raised their hand. Do you guys want to unmute yourself and ask a question? Or post in the chat, either one. No, I still, uh, I still can't post. Anyway, uh, this is Adriana. No, it was about when you talk about the single, um, the single body, uh, high body. Isn't that what um, Grand Styles does? I think he splits the highs every spring and then he combines them again at the end of the season and keeps them in one one deep yes because he's moving them south beekeepers in the south uh, manage in one box and uh, can do so more successfully than we can in the north um landy or justin do you know off the top of your head does he mainly use one box in new jersey during the summer uh that would be a good landy question um she, she, I, Landy had just posted that both Grant and Tim Stewart use that method of management. Um, yeah, those that move south are more likely, move their bees south, are more likely to try to adapt it. Um, it, it, uh, it's a, it's a workable system. Um, again, you're sacrificing a bit on honey production, uh, and you're, um, being very, very aware of what's going on in those units and timing, as in beekeeping, timing is everything. So, so it makes you a, a, a mighty, mighty fine beekeeper if you can successfully manage the one box system. And um, I guess, again, many of those that go to the south like it because that's how they manage bees further in the south, Florida, for example, Georgia, uh, Southern California, Texas. Um, beekeepers bring two boxes down from the north in the fall, split them, and then manage one box down in Texas, uh, Louisiana, for example. Uh, how far from the hive do AHA bees typically show defensiveness? Is a lot different from Apis mellifera. They are they are Apis mellifera, so it is the same species. It is just a different uh, ecotype, or some people use the word race not in favor these days. We label them as a subspecies. So the difference is um, they do follow further. Um, how far depends how many stings you have embedded in your, in your body and your equipment as to how, how far they follow. And uh, whether um, you, we try to keep bees in a corral, in a vegetation corral, so once you get out of the of a heavy corral, a heavy layer of vegetation around an apiary, there are a lot fewer bees following you. If it's open territory um, and uh, there's no vegetation really around, just shrubby stuff or ground stuff, they will follow you much further. And how far um, uh, depends how defensive how defensive the colony. There's two a uh, huge number of variables. But as far as you want to walk away from an apiary after you've been, you know, sweating and working in an apiary, we usually go to a vehicle and we get in the vehicle, shut the windows, uh, bake ourselves, and the, the bees eventually go to the windows. Um, going into a building or a building or a vehicle doesn't help. Those bees are still angry, uh, or been alerted, and try to sting. So uh, trying to escape into a building. Uh, or or ducking into vegetation or ducking into a vehicle um, doesn't release that behavior. They still are are intent upon defending their what they figure is their territory. Uh, let's see. I use a lot of single uh, deeps in the summer, uh, maximizes honey crop, then two deeps in the winter. This is John from uh, uh, your neighboring. I guess it's John in in uh, in. Uh, your county, I think he's in the Northeast, the Northwest group. Yeah, um, so John is another one that, that uh, t tends to try to do this, the, the uh, s uh, singles. He's adding up a, a winter box, in other words, a box that has mostly honey as a, as a way to, to get better wintering results. Um, but then um, 
bees will move up in that and then off and then that becomes your your box for managing them in the spring managing their population development because as as, as most of us know with two boxes the bees move up during the winter in and in, in, in most colonies, virtually all the colonies, uh, not all, but most of the colonies are in the top box come spring. And so you can then remove the lower box at that point, or you can do a reverse system. Um, the idea is with Italian bees, um, they have their racial char characteristic is to build big colonies. And so that's why we've gone to the two standards or the three mediums as so to, sort of a quote, our normal management system. And it makes our swarm control much easier because you can find when bees are preparing for swarming by looking on the underneath side of the top box of your two box system or between your boxes on your three medium box system. Um, swarm control is a little bit more difficult in a single box because the bees um, generally are not putting those swarm cells on the bottom at the entrance. And so you've got to do a little bit more uh, frame looking rather than just splitting boxes to look and see if they've started on, on developing queen cells. I'm sorry, I'm giving someone's talk here <laughs> in terms of a single. Would two <laughs> mediums work as well as one deep for a small hive? Um, and yes. Um, but but you get the issue of the interface between the two boxes as being ideal for the queens to start rearing queens earlier, where if you have one box, one deep, for example, um, the, uh, they don't have that interface, and so they don't uh, generally start on their swarm, uh, their rearing queen cells as quickly in a one box system as they do in a two or a three box system. Grant moves his bees between NC, North Carolina, and New York State. Yes, in North Jersey. Tim goes between South Jersey and Florida. Both use singles, split and super, then continue. And as, as I was trying to indicate that, uh, thanks, Landy, that is, um, that is where many of them learn the system. They, they started in Florida, and then they just bring those up north. Uh, and, and do the same way. Sometimes the bigger colonies are brought south in two boxes, and then as soon as they hit Florida, they are split back to one box. So there are a number of systems that they, they will work, the successful people. John says, yes, you need to be on top of swarming and other colony needs. Amen, John, I very much agree. It's, it, but it has some advantages as a, as a system, and of course, like any, there are those disadvantages. Um, I, I really admire those people that have got the system down. And, uh, and John, I know, is one that has, and, uh, and uh, apparently Grant and, uh, and, and uh, Tim. Um, did I miss any, uh, Dustin? Uh, that, did I, I'm, I'm not having any trouble. Oh, wait a minute. I, uh, Hold up. No. I, don't, I don't think so. Uh, Lane and okay. John, uh, John were the ones asking the most questions so okay um, all right yeah uh if i got any time left let me uh, finish with a couple more slides wait i had some questions okay the, yes i'm sorry go ahead oh okay they were they were further up in the chat um let's see i had a question about as far as african bees are concerned versus africanized um a lot of, you know, you showed a, a picture of a traditional log hive elevated for predators. Um, I guess a, a, a Maasai warrior was, was um, using smoke and fire to work that hive. So I know a lot of African countries and African beekeepers still use traditional hives. Uh, the ones that I've seen rather are, are baskets, woven baskets open at both ends rather than logs and um tim you know tim schuler has been encouraging beekeepers in malawi to switch to at least top bar hives which they can make with materials that they have on on hand you know versus langstroth which requires them to import materials they don't really have the resources to do that 
So I've been thinking like, what really is the advantage if you're an African beekeeper to switching to top bar hives? You know, yes, you've got movable frames, you can inspect the colonies, but these bees are not all that prone to diseases anyway, um, you know, and they can handle the mites. So why? What, what, why would we want to encourage African beekeepers to switch to Kenyan hives versus keeping their traditional log or basket hives? That's my question. The short answer, the short answer why, why <laughs> is we go over there to advise them. And so we advise them on what we know about. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> beekeeping for development, which which uh, I've been involved with for a number of years out of out of England, out of um, out of Monmouth, uh, advises against that uh, that that you know northern european that uh, that american beekeeper going over there and telling them how we do it and how and that means that they should do it the way we do it so they do advise some of the the uh, traditional ways the the one the one difference that it makes for example switching to the kenya top bar hive is that your material is cleaner um, and so the final extracted honey uh, will be uh, less of a need to clean it up and you do more frequent harvest so that the HMF, the, the, the uh, hydroxymethylferferol, which is a toxic sugar, uh, doesn't build up as quickly in the honey. Um, so if, if we're trying to introduce a system where we're going to um, ha ask them or encourage them to export their honey product, uh, then um, the top, Kenya Top Bar Hive makes a little bit more sense than do some of the natural materials. However, their cash product is beeswax. And, uh, and a number of the, uh, the natural materials, the rolled bark, the basket hives, um, hollows of one sort or another, uh, even ceramic hollows, um, it makes it easier for them for, for the beeswax harvest and for example to say the kenya top bar hive okay so right. um i did see that other question what's the difference between african and africanized bees and that's a that's a great question and a tough one to answer that this bee exists from south africa all the way up into ethiopia so it's a huge range of where it occurs and over parts of the range um uh, there is a, a very distinct difference if you go over the next mountain to a, another habitat. Uh, and so absconding, of which this bee does a lot, um, when resources aren't very favorable, it leaves home, it absconds, and it can go over that mountain and find those other resources, so it survives. Um, the Africanized bee has that same behavior, and and much of where it occurs in the Americas, that's not the case. You can't go over another mountain and find a, a habitat that's survivable. So many of these abscons do not survive in the Africanized population. And the other huge thing is that the Africanized bee is indeed a hybrid. We've crossed the African bee with the European bee. And so it has some of those hybrid behaviors. It is less defensive than a lot of the populations in Africa, but it also is adapting. So, for example, in my valley here in Bolivia, adapting to overwintering because those are the genes coming in from the European side. Um, so the huge difference is that we've got a, 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 a bee that is not so widely hybridized, changed in Africa versus an Africanized bee that we're continually trying to change it to make it something different in the Americas. That's the short <laughs> answer. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, weird question. Is there any evidence of AHB pollinating mangroves and have you ever heard of a Central American mangrove honey? Um, yeah, uh, a number of those trees and mangroves are related to gums. Um, one of our 
more famous honeys in um, the uh, the uh, Americas of from um, West Florida. Tupelo is a gum, and that West Florida habitat is essentially a, a mangrove. It's a it's a North American addition or or North American offshoot of a mangrove. Um, yes. Um, the, a, a very famous mangrove is between the countries of Bangladesh and India. Uh, and um, people still today go and hunt um, the wild nests of, of Apis mellifera and Apis dorsata in those mangroves facing Bengali tigers and, and gigantic crocodiles and tropical snakes and everything. Um, and uh, they're they're harvesting mangrove uh, uh, hun of mangrove honey, the Sudabarans of uh, Pakistan or uh, Bangladesh, uh, what used to be East Pakistan, Bangladesh, and uh, India. So yes, there is mangrove honey. Uh, so it's not such a such a weird question at all. Uh, generally, tropical honeys around the world are not as um, light colored they're not as favored on international trade they have a higher level of the toxic sugars the hmf uh, the sugar um, and generally our honeys that go for industrial uses uh making cigarettes and cigar wrappings and and lots of other different uses of honey and cheerios honey nut cheerios those type of things uh, because we have trained our clients to think of honey as a light amber color, and that's most best on the international market. Uh, uh, how large can African honey can I get in uh, New Jersey? Uh, boy, that's hard to say because it would be a hybrid. You would not uh, probably recognize it as being uh, the largest of your counties, but neither the smallest. So it, it was it, uh, a, lar a smaller size county, maybe to a, uh, a medium size county. It would not in New Jersey likely to get to be large if it has any percentage of Africanized genetic material. Uh, they just uh, they just want to leave. Considering the amount of stings Africanized bees place on one's bee suit, how often are bee suits laundered to remove alarm odor? Well, um, you know, I was brought up in Vermont and we used to take a, a bath every Saturday, whether we needed it or not, when I was growing up. That's a joke. Um, and so with bee suits, it's, it's uh, uh, bee suits are not washed. They're big, heavy fabric material. Um, in the countryside, there are no machines. You wash everything by hand. And uh, um, no, they're not washed uh, very frequently. What about the Puerto Rican African bees being less aggressive after the last disastrous hurricane? Yes, about 70% of the bees on the island of Puerto Rico were uh, eliminated, we believe, in the last uh, um, series of hurricanes, the two that came together. Maria was the worst of the two. And they did not want our bees. They did not want to use our bees to requeen because of a couple of studies that were done that looked at the material. Now, you got to understand when, when scientists look at materials, um, you got to understand where they collected the materials. So um, to do the study of looking at the bees on the island of Puerto Rico, and they came to the conclusion, these are were um, the, the, the bee people in Puerto Rico combined with people from the University of Illinois, uh, fine excellent bee lab, but you got to look at what they looked at in terms of their material. They looked at material from the larger beekeepers in the island of Puerto Rico. They did not collect uh, native uh, uh, bees from bee trees. They did not look at the many backyard colonies that were in boxes and, and uh, tubs and ceramic jugs and, and whatever plastics in the backyards. And so they recognized that they were gentler Africanized bees um, on the island of Puerto Rico. However, there is that second population, the population that was, was more uh, decimated, we believe, from those two hurricanes, uh, and that um, those were 
where more, more of those were lost. But that second population, um, the feral colonies, uh, had still were still very defensive, and in people's in, in backyards where they had one colony or something, but not the commercials. So um, you have to read that that those two uh, reports very carefully to understand what the bees were that they looked at to come to their conclusions that that uh, Puerto Rico had a hybrid population that was not very defensive and was very favorable for beekeeping on the island of Puerto Rico. Very favorable, yes, for the commercial beekeepers, yes. But we could say the very same thing for the commercial beekeepers of Arizona because they are requeening twice a year. So yes, they keep Africanized honeybees, but you can't keep them in your backyard in Tucson because they'll run you out of the yard and your neighbors out of the yard because those will be the feral Africanized bees. But there are commercial beekeepers in Arizona and in Puerto Rico that are keeping Africanized honeybees because they're continually requeening. Um, in that case, they were bringing queens in illegally, um, be, uh, not illegally, you, you, it, it wasn't against the law, but the, the suggestion was that that if they kept out bees uh, their population would be hybridized and would be a very gentle or gentler bee of Africanized bees sorry i've gone into some of the politics of beekeeping here what makes the Africanized honey bee better at controlling varroa mites um, if we knew um, the ten thousand the you know the hundred thousand dollar question we have some suggestions, but the major one is, um, so, the, so the varroa mite is a native to a bee that's in Asia. That population controls varroa mites because the varroa mites can only develop on drone brood. Drone brood, um, bigger bodies, a longer development time in the cap stage. Um, the varroa mite does not develop on a worker brood. Well, it turns out in Africanized honeybees, um, they have a they they do things faster, including rearing their worker bees. It's not 21 days from egg to adult; it's 19 days. And under those conditions, varroa might have relatively little chance to reproduce themselves in their reproductive phase when they enter the cap cell to be able to raise a daughter queen, a, da a daughter mite. So the only way they can raise their population, increase their population, is raising in the drone brood. Africanized bees control their drone brood. They rear drones very early in, in the, their development cycle, and then they stop. They stop rearing drones, um, unlike our European bees. I mean, we can find uh, our Italian bees rearing drones in September in our colonies, for example. Um, not so Africanized honeybees. Um, and so the Africanized honeybees control the rearing of when um, their drones are raised and they, um, the mites don't have enough time to develop on worker bodies, so only on the drone brood. So um, the, the mites just don't have a chance to get that generator going, reproducing, reproducing, reproducing like they do on our European bees. Um, so those are the, it's a, just a biological factor uh, of being able to do that. That being said, now here in, in Bolivia, a number of our beekeepers are now controlling our, our feeling. They have to control varroa mites. The difference is they are working, we are working with a hybrid bee. Uh, we have incorporated more European stock into the African stock in, in uh, Brazil. Primarily big breeding program there. Our bees in Bolivia, um, many of them go to Brazil to get the queen stock. So there's more European stock built into the bee that we have, the Africanized bee. And now we are beginning to have to think of, of varroa control. We are basically doing oxalic acid because we have a product out of Argentina that we use here. That's oxalic acid that's on a pad that we put in our colonies um, um, and it stays in the colonies for that period of time when, when our bees are rearing drones primarily.
All righty. Let me finish up then. Uh, Justin, uh, Landy, enough time to go on or we stop at this point and try to answer any more questions? I would uh, go ahead and, and bring us on home. All righty. Let's do that. So this is the uh, personal part. I uh, first uh, had my chance with Africanized bees when I went to um, um, the University of Delaware in 1981. We had an agreement with our university, Companion University in Panama. I went there uh, because we wanted to start a graduate program at the, that university. And I had the pleasure of capturing the second swarm captured in, in Panama that were Africanized bees that we identified as Africanized bees. That was in 1982, it was on the outskirts of Panama City. Um, and I've had a chance to go back for every, for, for, for all those years. Um, and uh, in 1990s, I, I remarried a, a lovely young lady from um, Bolivia, an ag economist. And so we come to Bolivia. Uh, and now in retirement, the plan was to spend six months and six months um, the, the virus has changed some of that. So I'm in Bolivia right now where I'm talking from, but I'm only here for a, a shorter trip this year. My wife still has a very extensive family and comes longer. So I've continued to be um, through the Americas, but initially starting in Panama and more recently here in Bolivia. So where is Bolivia? It's south of the equator. It's the green country on the map of the left. Where am I? I'm in the... Uh, the largest of the Andes mountain valleys uh, at 8,200 feet, uh, well above uh, Denver, for example, at elevation. Uh, it's where the Amazon River starts. Some of the parts of become the Amazon River. They start here in this uh, mountains, training into this valley, and then, then uh, going eventually south, and then eventually uh, east, and eventually north, <laughs> turning around and going back up into the Amazon. Um, and, and these are the best areas. So we keep bees up to about 9,000 feet uh, on down into the tropics. Um, the honeys here are lighter honeys, uh, more favorable. Um, we have um, some areas that are considered organic uh, in terms of their production. Um, and so uh, it's, it's uh, you know, the high valleys of the, of the Andes mountain ranges are some of the best of the areas uh, outside of, of Argentina and, of course, uh, Chile in, in South America. Uh, that's where I am and where I'm talking to you from. We do keep bees in the city here. Initially, there were very few. So the left sh photo shows a, a, a cupola of a, of a chapel, and the chapel is on the main square in the city. Every city has a square. It has a, a major cathedral. This is one of the other school uh, churches. So these are bees on a third level balcony, um, just, um, just within spitting distance, literally spitting distance of the main square of the city. Um, and the photo on the right, the arrow is showing where the pig farm is behind the bees that are there. Um, those bees are actually pretty defensive and the, and the beekeeper has to um, uh, manage them with consideration of the animals next door. Uh, we keep bees in small boxes. Uh, we may add a shallow super, but then remove it quickly. Um, Africanized bees here use an awful lot of propolis, and that's our major product here, uh, harvesting the propolis. They are quick to swarm, abscond, or usurp colonies. That is, they move out of their own colony, move to a side of another colony. Worker bees go in, kill the queen in that colony, and then the bees go on in. They're usually very small swarm, very small absconds. Uh, we look at them as little as possible, do an awful lot of dividing. We keep them small, try to keep them productive by removing honey. honey. And we uh, requeen um, very frequently with queen cells. So as that bees would fill each of those boxes, um, I will divide that three different ways. Uh, put a queen cell in all three divides. The queen's in one of the three when I do the divide. I don't care. I put queen cells in all three. The one that has the queen will kill that queen cell, but the other two will requeen with that queen cell. And, and the, the large ones, I just keep eliminating. Um, and the, the very defensive ones, I keep eliminating or I will move. This is a city apiary. Um, anything that gets at all defensive 
is moved out of here. These are basically bees kept for breeding in this case. And you can see the next level up are some smaller boxes. We, we use a system very similar to, to what North American queen breeders use. We basically create an emergency situation to rear queens. Um, I, here's a, one of the fellows from Canada that was down. Um, so here, uh, just uh, not only but a couple, three splits, spits from my house here, where I am, is uh, one of our breeders um, breeding here on the roof of his home. You can see he's well surrounded. All of these colonies are not large. Um, these are his breeders, in other words. So these are more selected stock. And from that, he'll raise the queen cells. All of the production for um, bees is usually um, going up. You see the hillsides around. This is a valley. Uh, mountain uh, passes, the, the smallest, the lowest mountain passes about uh, 10, 10, 700 feet. The highest is over 14. So we're surrounded by high mountains, but the, those mountains, um, uh, when we get rains like now, just get green as can be, and then they flower like crazy. And so it's just a nice setup. We produce eucalyptus honey and, uh, and the gums honey earlier in the year. And, then, and from the eucalyptus is where we collect our propolis. We use uh, standard propolis traps. So what are the problems that we work with? Problem number one is, is gentle stock. Um, it is essentially impossible to find a uh, queen. So we try to replace queens with, uh, with uh, 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 you know, queen cells, requeening re with queen cells. The, the, the queen is very, very sensitive to light. So as immediately you open up a bee colony, the bees themselves too, open up a bee colony, they start parading around the inside of the box, literally parading around and around and around. So the queen, they, the bees abandon brood. They, the queen will quickly leave the brood area. So um, the easiest way to find a queen when we have to find a queen is force all the bees to go through a queen excluder. Uh, but we usually don't worry about that. I'll divide a, a full box into three boxes. And as they say, put a queen cell on each of the three. The one that has the queen, the one third that has the queen, they'll kill that queen cell, but my other two will requeen. Um, and, and the whole concept is to um, build, uh, develop a building colony when the resource is available. And um, a uh, developing colony will store that resource, in other words, the honey or propolis, and then by, by continually, or pollen, or by continually harvesting, then we keep ahead of them but, so that they don't get uh, enough resources that, that they think, ah, we're done for the, for, we're done for the season and it's time to leave home or it's time to split into a reproductive swarm. So you've got to be really thinking of, of, of the bee in this case and what they're doing um, and managing them accordingly. It's, it's a much more intensive management, but it's less intensive looking at colonies. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense, but it just, um, it's not an awful lot of fun when you go on an apiary with, with a dozen or so colonies because eventually you hit the colony that's very defensive and then you've got all these bees in the air and it's just, um, you know, Many cases, I quit apiaries uh, in my management before um, I get finished with the whole apiary. Uh, it just it just doesn't become fun anymore. They kind of do take the fun out. Second is this swarming, absconding, usurping behavior that they do all the time. And of course, uh, the swarms then move out. Uh, uh, and uh, basically, uh, what we attempt to do in a more rural area is own a piece of property that has a high uh, 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 fence around it, a cement fence or uh, or or, or uh, walled some big walled structure around a, a residence. Um, someone lives in a residence. The person that we we get to live in the residence, and we keep our colonies then within that corral. Uh, of the of the fence and the bees will swarm to the same spots generally when we when a swarm uh, cast from a colony and so we go to these these spots where they go and capture our swarms there 
um, and that way try to contain our colonies within a, 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 a big walled uh, farm, a, a farmhouse basically, uh, but, but someone is living in the farmhouse. And of course, the problem number three is their defensiveness. Um, you know, we keep bees in the U.S. if we're not commercial for fun. And when it doesn't get fun anymore, we give them up. So you fight mites for a while. And if it's a losing battle, you end up giving them up. So it's a very much the same in terms of this, this defensiveness. Now, now, that's people that live in more communities. Um, in the rural areas, um, Africanized bees have been a real boon to the uh, economy of, of the, particularly the younger individuals that want to put up with this defensiveness because now you don't have to pay for bees. You capture swarms and you put them in some sort of a domicile, some sort of a box or something, and then you uh, destruct harvest them. So. It's made a difference for many, many, many rural families that uh, uh, you keep uh, half a dozen, you capture half a dozen swarms, and that may result in about half of the income for that um, uh, owner, that farmer uh, during the year. Um, their rural economy is not a cash economy, but it's becoming more so. Um, if you need a uh, yoke of oxen, you rent them and you give your labor back to the owner of the oxen on his farm. You know, no cash basis, but, you know, school requires uh, um, uh, cash payments for uniforms for the kids, et cetera. So the rural economy is adapting a little bit more for a cash economy, but the bees in their, their income from, from honey, a good barter item, but also a sale item. Um, you know, again, uh, just maybe five colonies can result in about half of an income for a rural family. So uh, there, there is a very big plus in terms of what has happened with Africanized bees in throughout the American countries. And finally, I mentioned the non-problem. I talked about why we think uh, where, where our studies seem to indicate why. Um, the the Africanized bee in, in its more pure genetic material doesn't have problems with mites, but as we add in more European stock, uh, uh, we are thinking of mite control. So far as I indicated, we, um, we do not have a, a, the availability of the chemicals here. Um, the amitraz, of course, um, uh, it has been used, it's been used in Argentina. Uh, but more um, oxalic acid uh, being fairly effective, but only because we can put it into a colony um, during the time when the population is there. Um, in the United States, uh, uh, we know oxalic does not work well uh, when there is a lot of brood present. Um, here, because the oxalic is held in the colony for a longer period of time on these pads from from this product from Argentina, it, uh, it is more effective. Um, and many of you have listened to um, Randy Oliver more recently. Um, he's talked about his research efforts in terms of looking at how to put oxalic into the um, bee system and keeping it there for long enough to give uh, control for, um, because it doesn't control mites and brood. And so this is a system that has been worked on in, out in Argentina, in the south, where they have European bees. And there is the approved product, at least in, sold in Argentina, in, uh, here in, our, in Bolivia, that we use to help control mites. Hopefully, um, uh, uh, they'll be able to uh, come up with a better system, an approved system in the U.S., that will uh, uh, allow us to keep oxalic, colony, oxalic acid in colonies for a lengthier period of time and provide for that control. So um, that's a look at defensiveness. Um, Afghan bees, what they are, and a little bit of what my system is here. Questions again? Okay, I look, let's see. Can we make a club trip to visit you? Yeah, come on down. Uh, we can help you inspect your hives. Yep. Um, I, I, in the in the early days, when when Africanized bees were the thing, I arranged trips for beekeepers to uh, to uh, Costa Rica, 
uh, to Panama. We had we had great fun. We we ran from half a dozen aperies every one of the trips, uh, just to, in fear of our lives. Yep, come on down. Uh, why do they use the product? Well, what do they use the product for propolis for? It's a human for humans and and uh, both internally and externally. It is it is probably the most valuable product that we can get from our bee colonies. Much more valuable than honey, I think. And and beeswax. Well, I mean, if you use cosmetics, you need beeswax. How much honey flows per season? Um, okay, we measure it a little bit differently here, but but a good county uh, annual harvest here would be about twenty five pounds. Uh, and how long is the active season versus our version of winter and the inactive season? Um, our inactive season is the dry season here. So our season begins here in spring um, in uh, October, November, eucalyptus, uh, things that have deep roots, things that are right along river areas, the, the gum trees, uh, the uh, populars for poplar, for example, the eucalyptus, November, and then we get rains in, uh, in um, December. Um, uh, and then uh, we get the the summer flow, summer yellows, the spring yellows, the summer yellows, the, the weedy things and all those other things. And of course, the, in the dairy area, we get um, alfalfa primarily still here, some clovers, some vetches. And then uh, we do get a spring uh, bloom here, but uh, as in, in North Jersey and New York State, uh, you can only get some uh, a small amount of honey out of the out of the the fruit bloom uh, every year, uh, maybe half of a super or so. About the about the same here, ten pounds from the lighter honeys and and uh, uh, maybe another twenty or so pound, 20, 15, 20 pounds a year from the sort of the ambers, the, the weedy stuff. And then we do get a, a darker honey that, uh, um, that, I mean, you know, you put propolis in it, it's going to darken it anyway. You put pollen in it, it's going to darken it anyway. We don't sell an awful lot of honey as honey. We sell a lot of honey at, as a medicine, honey with uh, pollen, honey with uh, propolis, a lot of propolis. How many honey flows per season? Basically we get two. Uh, because the rainy, when it's really rainy in December, we don't get very much. And how long is the active season versus our version? It's about the same, I think, I, going over that. Thank you, Dewey. Okay, thanks. Thank, wonderful. Everyone's ready to check out. It's been a long night. Other questions? Anyone want to un, uh, unmute and ask the a, ask a question directly? When are you coming back up to the States? Uh, February. Uh, I, I'm going to talk to a couple of clubs in the, in the uh, Arizona area on their Africanized bees and, uh, and have a chance to, uh, to, to look at how the commercials are handling uh, Africanized bees uh, in Southern Arizona. I, I did a sabbatic in, in, uh, in Tucson in a long time ago in the seventies. And so, uh, I want to get back and see some of the changes that have occurred since then. Nice. Somebody had a raised hand. Who was that? It's Bonnie down in North Carolina. Oh. I, hi. I wanted to know, how do you attack? You said you use queen cells instead of queens. Um, how do you attach that queen cell to an Africanized hive that is so grumpy? Um, so you have a colony that's got either five or six uh, brood on five or six frames. So we take that colony, we break it into three colonies. Basically, you're making a, a two brood uh, frame uh, split like we would with our colony. So you take a six frame uh, brood and split it into three colonies. Each of the colonies getting two frames of brood and one support frame. It's, it's the very same way we make a nuke in the U.S., and then we take the uh, capped queen cell and we press it into the area of the brood, just sort of below the top bar. Uh, and then, then close them back up. Uh, we 
we don't take the other, we don't take them out of the, the apiary. So every colony that's strong enough that has six frames, um, we will split because what we're looking at is a split about one month ahead of when uh, the, the rains will stop and we'll get that, that nectar flow coming on. That's, that's our timing. So as I say, timing is everything. If we split too early, those two frame splits grow up to be monsters and, and might have to be split again. If we split too late, uh, we just have too weak a growing colony to, to be able to do very much for honey production. And so our harvest is the outer two frames. Um, and uh, and uh, when we do the split, we, we may only harvest one of the two frames. Make thank any you. sense? Yes, thank you. Anybody else have questions for Dewey? Well, I'd like to uh, say thanks to uh, uh, Landy for, uh, for uh, asking me to be able to give this presentation and especially uh, to, uh, to Justin. Um, we're using his uh, company's uh, framework here for the, for the meeting and uh, um, he was most helpful in, in getting me onto it and, uh, and my learning the basics so we'll be able to present this as, tonight. So I thank both of you and I thank everyone that was able to attend this evening. Uh, appreciate it. I hope, um, hope it was some information that you uh, were be able to use and, uh, and uh, uh, be able to adapt it to your own beekeeping. And, and pressure La Landy to uh, get someone that uh, Grant or one of the others, uh, you know, Grant's hard to get that onto a program, but um, to help him talk about that, that, that one box management system. I'll it's, do that. I promise. It's a, challenge. it's a good challenge. We always want to challenge ourselves with be. He spoke about that at the Man Lake um, a barbecue um, event uh, this past summer. Who did? Steve Rapaski. Steve did. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can twist. I could get either of them to to give us a talk on it. Landy's very persuasive, let me tell you. <laughs> and before everybody goes, I, I did make an announcement, but I don't think we have as many people as we do now, or maybe we have a different crew. Um, but next month, um, again, is our um, annual meeting, election of officers. Watch your emails and show up at the meeting because you're not going to be able to do it from the comfort of your own home. Okay. All right. Thank you again, Dewey. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Dewey. It was a great presentation. Thank okay. you. Thank you, both. Thank you all. Night. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs>